Hello, and welcome to the final presentation of Adagio Health's 2021 Better Health Outcomes Speaker Series. I'm BJ Leber, President and CEO of Adagio Health. Thank you so much for being with us today. We launched this series back in February of 2021. We wanted to continue important conversations about women's health and health equity while keeping everyone safe during the COVID pandemic. It worked, in fact, it has worked so well that we will continue the speaker series next year. In 2022, speakers will focus on topics such as the unique and diverse health and wellness needs of women veterans, competency and healthcare for the LGBTQ community, and better understanding of health equity issues that affect people with disabilities. This past year, our speakers covered food insecurity, behavioral health and black maternal health, Today, our focus is on race, health, and equity, as we hear from Dr. Margaret Pettigrew, Chief Clinical Diversity and Inclusion Officer for Allegheny Health Network. Before we meet Dr. Pettigrew, I am pleased to introduce Yvonne Cook. Yvonne is president of the Highmark Foundation, the presenting sponsor of the Better Health Outcomes Speaker Series. Thank you, BJ and Adagio Health. On behalf of the Highmark Foundation, we are elated to be the presenting sponsor of the Better Health Outcomes Speaker Series. This series has been phenomenal. If you've missed some of the other sessions, please go to the Adagio Health website to check out the previous series. But this series is really about presenting opportunities to reflect on some of the biggest challenges that we that we faced over the course of the pandemic food insecurity uh, mental health um, black maternal crisis and today's uh, look at race uh, health and equity highmark foundation is dedicated to improving the health and well-being of individuals in the communities that we serve throughout pennsylvania and in west virginia central to the foundation's mission is identifying and continuously reevaluating our region's prevailing health care needs and pinpointing these issues that most urgently need support that work has taken on importance with the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are proud to partner with Adagio Health and work together with them on innovative solutions to meet our community's most pressing needs. Thank you for your support of these important issues and for this series, and we hope that if you haven't had a chance to see the previous sessions, that you'll take a moment to go back and take a look at them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you to our presenting sponsor, Highmark Foundation, along with the other local businesses and foundations that have supported our series, PNC, Henry L. Hillman Foundation, Federal Home Loan Bank, Dollar Bank, Allegheny Health Network, and the Pittsburgh Business Group on Health. We are so very grateful for your support. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Margaret Larkins Pettigrew is the Senior Vice President and Chief Clinical Diversity Officer for Allegheny Health Network and Highmark here in Pittsburgh. She is an expert healthcare strategist in the care of women living in low to middle resource communities, a clinical educator, and a busy practitioner. Dr. Pettigrew is also the founder of WON. D O O R pronounced one door, and it stands for Women and Newborns, Diversity, Outreach Opportunity, and Research, a program that aims to educate global medical providers through local and international healthcare collaborations. Remember those initials, there will be a test later. Prior to receiving her medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh, she practiced as a critical care nurse. 
She also holds master's degrees in education as well as public policy management and international affairs. Dr. Pettigrew is a proud veteran of the United States Navy where she cared for active duty members, veterans and their families. She is the recipient of numerous honors and awards for her work. We are so very glad that she is back in Pittsburgh and that she is with us today as we close out the 2021 edition of Adagio Health's Better Health Outcomes Speaker Series. So greetings, everyone. Thank you so much, BJ and staff of Adagio. Of course, it's uh, wonderful to be back in Pittsburgh, but also to be part of this series because I was part of Adagio for a while when I was here working in Pittsburgh. So I know the good work that Adagio does and continues to do as it's more than just seeing patients, it's more about advocacy and making sure that we're giving all women an opportunity to have comprehensive care. So thank you for the wonderful introduction. And um, I just wanna um, take some time to share some of my thoughts and some of the work that I'm doing, uh, that I've been doing. I've commuted for the last 10 years to Cleveland. I'm back and I'm having a wonderful time here at Highmark as I came back in and, and was able to start this Institute, Institute of Equity. But we're gonna dive right in and start talking about this whole issue of race, equity and healthcare related to health disparities and how hopefully we're gonna to try to make sure that we're moving toward a positive way of having better outcomes. So I'm gonna go ahead and slide my, start my slide projection, my slides. And the first slide is just tells you a little bit about who I am. And this is just um, who I am is, is at the bottom, but this whole issue of the Equitable Health Institute is a big deal because that means that someone, which means Highmark has actually invested in making sure that this is a, a journey that's not going to end, that this is an institute. But today I really wanna focus on health equity, maternal health and infant health. And you can go to the next slide. We'll jump right in. You all know that I am a um, OBGYN and I specialize in, in care for HIV positive patients, women. And in that journey uh, for over the many years I've been doing that, of course, women wake up every single morning just trying to be women in this country. However, women who have uh, other issues like HIV or just women who've been subjected to toxic issues in this country really are at a disadvantage to receiving great health and, and great health care here. So when I talk about health and health care, I wanted to start here because it's linked to so much. And in front of you see, we talk about environmental issues that we're concerned about, the fact that we're disadvantaged, people are, are been, in many times disadvantaged socially, economically, and then all of the other dimensions that BJ mentioned, we talked as far as the series is concerned, LGBT population, people living with disabilities, and then we have to think about socioeconomic status, age, et cetera. So as the next slide, we'll go to the next slide. I really want you to take a look at this slide and look what the definition between equality versus equity is. And this is where we find the issue because when we talk about equality, that means sameness. So everybody has the same thing, but equity really means that people have the same thing, but have access to opportunities. And that is where we have to sit in this country, in this healthcare systems that we serve in order to try to make a difference to balance out the lives of all the people we serve, especially women and children. So the next slide goes right into my conversation about equity and, and the definition about equity. And Kamara Jones, phenomenal, she's at Harvard. She talks about equity uh, extensively in a lot of her, her research in her series that she does around you know, how we improve um, and how we got here. And so I want you to pay attention to her name, pull up her book, buy her books. They are significant. If you want to be in this space about health equity, she has some how to do information for you. So basically a simple definition, the assurance of the condition of optimal health for all people. We're not just talking about people of color. We're talking about everybody because when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, everybody has to be at the table and I often say, when we talk about diversity, we say, what's the definition of diversity? People right away say, well, we're talking about African-Americans. No, we're talking about everybody because to do this right, white folks have to be at the table. We all have to be there. We all have to be responsible and accountable. And so we talk about making sure that it is a space where everybody has great health care. Everyone, all of us have to be there. So the next slide then 
uh, talks about how we got here and how do health disparities arise. And we know they exist, we see them every single day. But these are the three major things that we need to be concerned about when we talk about disparities. So the quality of healthcare with any healthcare system, study after study has shown that we have treated people very differently based on the color of their skin, their gender identity, their living with, with disabilities. And so when you talk about within the healthcare system, how do we as clinicians meet our patients every single day to make sure that they, they are welcoming, that we're welcoming, and that they are belonging to a system where we are partners with them. So within our healthcare systems themselves, we do not treat people the same. It, for example, in the cart world of cardiac disease, and we can talk about OBGYN, which is really important to me because that's what I do, but let's start with cardiac disease. We, we know that many studies have shown that there are poor outcomes for black men who suffer, and black women who suffer a heart attack. Delays in treatment, and we know that there are specific things that happen when people have heart attacks or when people are, 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 are close to having an event. Well, we've, we've so, seen a difference in the treatment of those patients who look like me, who may be disabled. And that is, that is data that we need to hold on to because data will guide us to make changes that will, will guide us to have better outcomes. So think about the data that we're talking about. So that's, we have the data, enough data, so now how do we use that data? We find differences in access to care. How are we making sure that all people have access to care? If even if they don't have insurance, how are we taking care of the uninsured? If they have minimal insurance, how are we making sure they get all the care they need, not only when they're ill, but preventive health? And then when they're very ill, how do we take care of them when they're sometimes at the end, just end stages of their lives? Everybody has to have access to care. But access to care is very different than accessing care because that's the space that I live in all the time when we talk about equity. People who have insurance, people who are members of, of major hospital systems may not access care. Multiple reasons for that, but we find that in the space of OBGYN and black women, many of them don't access care because of the way they've been treated in the system. We've been through this pandemic. We know what's happened with, with distrust and why people were hesitant to get the vaccine. There's a long history of how people have been treated in this country, especially people of, of color. We can talk about a whole series about structural racism, you know, how we have to deal with that, dismantle that, and how we have to embrace it and make sure that we move on without blame or shame. But recognizing that people don't access care sometimes because they feel as if there has been a disconnect between their, their clinician and themselves related to dignity and respect. And so when we talk about access to care, we have to also think about how, why, how and why people are not accessing care. Other reasons, of course, transportation, all those social determinants of health that we need to think about. When I was here, I was a part of a great practice and we took care of women who didn't make their appointments on time or they didn't come to their appointments. And instead of yelling at them and making them feel bad about arriving late, we wanted to know why they arrived late or didn't come. We found that women spent more money to make sure they could transport around the system and the city to take care of their children and to buy bread versus taking care of themselves. So it's all about how we teach women to have self-care. And if we as, as, as systems, as clinical systems that want to do right, who carry the label of caring all the time, we have to embrace all of those things that impact others' lives, such as the fact that many people don't have life opportunities that they should. If you can't buy a home, if you don't have, if you have a large wealth, you're in that large wealth gap that we have in this country, and many people who are disenfranchised are, then how are you? And that's where you find your wealth. If you can't own a home, then you can't send your children to school. You can't send your children to college. You can't do those great things. So life opportunities that have happened and that are historical, that we have data that says, this is what happened in our country that we must take care of. And then we think about other exposures, the environmental exposures that, the exposures that happen to all people, but especially to women and women of color. During this pandemic, women of color came to work 
because they needed to come to work. They were first line workers with others, of course, but they, many of them were at or below the poverty level. They had to go to work. They had to go to the grocery stores in order to work as clerks. You know, they were out there, they were in the hospital system. They had to go to work because that's what they do. And then look at women who have breast cancer. Statistics tell us women who have breast cancer, who are of color, many times choose not to have a simple lumpectomy. But when they think about the risk and benefits of recurrence and the fact that they have to miss work to get treatment, and they know they cannot miss work because they have to take killings, they choose to have bilateral mastectomies. Data, data matters. And we, we take a look at what is happening as it relates to demographics we will be able to move away from this space of where we are. Significant dis disparities. Talk about stress. There are many, many studies about toxic stress that women wake up every day faced with. But think about the fact that women who are of color have micro and macro aggressions that occur to, with them every single day of their lives. No matter where they are in the ladder, on the educational ladder or social economic ladder, the stressors are there and they occur every single day. I'm gonna give you a couple examples. One, myself, big room, all executives, not here, but other, another place I worked at. And we were talking about the shortages in our hospital system. And we said, oh my God, we don't have this many nurses and we need a neurosurgeon and we need all these folks. And they said, we need environment, environmental service workers. And he looked at me, the only African-American, because many times, I'm the only one at the table, or many Blacks are the only ones at the table, but if you're there, you, be, you better have a voice. And he said to me, Margaret, can you go to your communities? Now, he had no idea where I work, right? Michael just has made the assumption. Go to your communities and tell your churches that we have jobs in the Environmental Service Department. He didn't tell me, go tell people that we, that we have nursing, a nursing shortage. He said environmental services. What does that tell you as you look around in all of the hospital systems and you see the majority of people who work at the lower levels that do just as much work and are so much, impo much important than everybody else are people of color. So he said, oh, offer them to the, your people these positions. Let them know we have these positions, right? And so of course, you know, I left that meeting and I was fuming because he didn't understand the microaggressions that he had just exposed in that meeting. So I went away, I wrote letters to multiple churches and told them that there was this, this great opportunity to start at the ground up, ground, at the ground and to look up the, all the opportunities that were available in the hospital system. This is an entry level job. But I sent that to the synagogues, the Baptist religions, everywhere that I could, because I knew that everybody needs an opportunity to start somewhere. But I sent a letter back to the gentleman who asked me to do that and told him what I did and said to him, this will give you a diverse pool in order for us to hire great people who really want a job and want to work. Now, my, my feeling was that I hope that he understood that when he talked about my people, my community, your churches, that it would ring a bell that we're all in this together and that he needed to check himself like we all need to do. Now those, that's a simple stressor that many of us have lived with, with every single day of our lives. Unknowing people who are not conscious and not, and not bias alert, say things that are hurtful, builds up to be significant stresses that then make a difference in many of the underlying health status, health conditions that we have throughout our country. So understand, that the disparities arise, have, have been arising for many, many years. It was based on how we developed this country, but we are here now. And it is time for us to understand how we got here, educate ourselves, really embrace how we got here so we can move on. And so when we move to the next slide, we would, I really wanna talk to you a little bit about the misconceptions and in, in, uh, the barriers to um, how we can actually achieve health equity. And uh, Kamara Jones also, my favorite, I told you about her already. She has these four concepts that she talks about that are myths that we must face. And the first one is the myth of zero, zero sum game. We've heard that over and over. If I give up something, 
I have to give up something in order for someone else to, to get it. You know, this space where there's there's not enough for everybody. That if I give up any, uh, if I give anything, I'm going to lose my privilege, right? We have to understand that we're in this together. And when when you uplift the folks who are underneath you, you, you are lifted as well. And we, that's been proven time and time again, not only in the healthcare system, but in all the businesses. And so we have to dismiss that, that concept and understand that if we bring talent and expertise of all races, of all ethnicities, and all, all issues that we have, not issues, but all the qualities that we have in this, in this world, um, in people, then we are gonna make a difference. So we have to get rid of that whole concept of I'm gonna lose something if I give anyone else an inch. And I'm, I can't, I, I'm gonna climb on other folks' backs to get where I wanna be, you know, because that's the way I have to do it. It is time for us to be game changers and we need to move forward and get rid of this myth. And then limited future orientation. So we don't want, it, we don't want to accept the fact that our demographics in this country is changing and that we really have to embrace that and think in the future of how we are going to be oriented to deal with the, with the future, the orientation of the future. And we can't do that with blinders on. We continue to behave the way we, we have been behaved and subject people to inequities in our health systems. The myth of the American exceptionalism, we are better, we are greater. We can't, we can't accept any immigrants from other countries because they are not as great as we are. They're not as educated as we are. We are beyond that. And, and we all know who's on this Zoom that we are well beyond that. And we need to understand that immigration, folks coming into this country from all over, they are important to who we are, who we want to be. So we have to dismiss the, that myth that we are the best and we are the greatest. And we've proven that to ourselves, that is not true. And then the last one is this whole white supremacist ideology. Of course, we have white supremacists live in our country. We have, of course, we have, we have white supremacists live in our communities, but what does that mean? So this whole thing, when you talk about white supremacist is one thing. When you talk about the white supremacy, supremacist ide ideology is actually very different. That's, that takes on a whole picture of privilege and how the country was built and what you do with that. And, and, and when I sit here for a minute because no one wants to be a racist. No one wants to be called a racist. And we, under, we have to understand that we cannot do that because the attitudes be our behaviors and behaviors sometimes appear to others who are looking in that there may be racist behaviors, but we don't want to have that label and give that label to anybody. So that we need to really think about where we are with the barriers to health equity in order for us to move on. So the next slide, I really wanna talk a little bit about um, how we should be thinking as it relates to us in teens and how we're all responsible for one another. <clears throat> Excuse me. Malcolm X um, made, said this quote, when he and Martin Luther King were finally getting to a space where they were thinking on the same, they were like, well, you know, this whole thing about wellness, you know, we've got to do this together. And that um, we, you know, although we want it, we want freedom in, in, in different ways, violence versus nonviolence, this issue around healthcare, we've got to do it together. And you, you read Malcolm, a lot of Malcolm X statements and you read a lot of uh, Martin Luther King statements about healthcare, you will see that they were, they were on the same page when Malcolm X wrote this. And he said, when I is replaced with we, so think about the I and how you can't be about I. And if you find yourself in every single day using that word I, know that you are not in the right space as far as healthcare, because we need the we, because we want we, when we have, we, we go get to the we, then illness becomes wellness. And that we see that every single day as we work with our colleagues, as we do many things together in our own institutions. But we have to look beyond that. We have to look in our political arenas. We have to look in our social arenas. How do we do this together? And that's what I want you to take away from this quote. So when I is replaced with we, even illness will become wellness. And we want wellness and productivity for all of the people that we take care of, especially women. Next, the next slide. Um, this is where I want to actually play a video for you. And so uh, Daniel Dawes wrote the book, 100 Years of Obamacare. 
and he talked about the healthcare system and how we got to Obamacare over the many, many centuries. I mean, the, the, to find healthcare for all and to make sure that everybody was taken care of. He wrote that book and really it was the, it was the history of how we even got to this space where everyone did not have adequate care in this country. But before we talk about um, but how we talk about maternal health and fetal health, which is where I want us to, to be in this space today. I want you to look at this uh, film because it really talks about how political determinants take us to our social determinants of life. To best grasp the political determinants of health, let's examine a hypothetical example that combines experiences of real people in urban and rural communities. Imagine a 19-year-old woman, we'll call her Jessica. After enduring several miscarriages, she barely survives giving birth to an infant nine weeks early, the baby weighing only three pounds. Her son is placed in the neonatal intensive care unit, the blood from his umbilical cord revealing over 200 toxins. Where did the system fail Jessica and her baby? How and why did these results occur? Three years earlier, Jessica had left her parents' house. Access to treatment for her dad's substance use disorder had been eliminated when policymakers closed three of the city's public community health centers to save money. Contending with his wife's lack of education, neither of Jessica's parents could secure a job with a livable wage, prompting serious and substantial mental health conditions. Jessica moved to a low-income neighborhood in the city. She never knew of the extent of how the appalling conditions of her neighborhood were politically determined. For example, determined to keep housing segregation in place, politicians expended very few resources to build sidewalks, parks, or recreational facilities. Healthcare providers refused to operate in Jessica's community due to poor reimbursement rates for Medicaid. Because they resisted creating bus routes, lawmakers dissuaded grocery stores from operating in the community, preventing residents' access to fresh fruit, vegetables, and meat. Simultaneously, policymakers altered zoning laws to permit development of a dump site and a chemical plant, switching the community's water source from a clean river 10 miles away to a nearby polluted river to save money. This water was used to drink, bathe, and wash clothes, it also irrigated the lawn at Jessica's apartment building, adding to the list of pollutants and environmental hazards in her neighborhood. And because her district lacked established tenant rights, her landlord had no interest in improving unhealthy housing practices. Jessica found work as a cashier at the corner convenience store, a job with no employee benefits, including health or disability insurance. Because policymakers rejected proposals to increase minimum wage to a livable income, Jessica often substituted her employer's free snacks policy as a meal, never realizing the effect that high-fat, high-sodium food would eventually have on her or her baby's health. With local politicians striking down an effort to ban smoking in convenience stores, Jessica was constantly subjected to a barrage of secondhand smoke. And when she discovered she was pregnant, no attempt at receiving health insurance coverage was successful. Her non-ACA compliant plan denied her maternity coverage because they viewed her pregnancy as a pre-existing condition. Medicaid, the government's health insurance program for low-income families, denied her coverage for not being poor enough. After finding a ride to the free clinic, Jessica waited more than half a day to be seen by a second-rate physician a doctor who was condescending and offensive. Realizing she could not afford to take more days off from work, she never went back. At 31 weeks, a neighbor drove Jessica to a hospital ER 20 miles away. Seeing that Jessica was experiencing excessive swelling in her face and ankles, as well as seizures, the emergency team decided to deliver her premature son immediately. Due to complications, her newborn son was sent to the neonatal intensive care unit. Once his organs were deemed mature enough, he was taken off the machines and sent home with severe cognitive defects. And in their apartment, 
Jessica and the baby were exposed to mildew and cockroaches, causing her son to develop respiratory problems. The landlord refused to remedy the poor conditions, telling her to move if she didn't like it there. Jessica struggled to find early childhood care and access to schools with educational assistance, healthy food options, and other resources needed to thrive. Because their school and community lacked the resources to enable Jessica's son to even barely reach his potential, he dropped out of school after entering eighth grade, just as his grandmother had done, repeating what is surely the ongoing rule of poverty. Jessica's story shows the compounding effect of political determinants over personal responsibility. No matter how reliably Jessica tried to act, structural, institutional, intrapersonal, and interpersonal obstacles stood in her way. Political determinants were pulling strings that prevented Jessica and her family from achieving optimal health and their full potential. What does this mean for all of us? What can we do to improve and mend our community's most damaged systems? So I hope that you'll take an opportunity to go back and really look at that video again. It really does show you the stressors and the challenges as well as opportunities that we have that have affected women in this country and families in this country. So understanding that the social determinants of health really do result in the, the excuse me, the political determinants of health really result in the social determinants of health. And we cannot look at one without looking at the other. So when we go to the next slide, I really wanna concentrate on what happens to mom as she takes care of her baby, because these are the things we worry about when we talk about making sure there's good outcomes for moms. And on this slide, the only thing I want you to pay attention to is whether it's a preterm baby, late preterm baby, or a very late preterm baby, and, and we know what those weeks are, that we see 414 babies die every single, every single week in the United States, and they do not see their first birthdays. And so let's, let's think a little bit about where we are with how we maintain mom's health in order to have a, a great outcome as far as her baby's concerned. And if you go to the next slide, it really is going to start, I'm going to start showing you some statistics and I'm going to go pretty quickly. So on this slide, this is just race and ethnicity as it relates to preterm. And you look at that very quickly, you see that blacks have the highest rate of poor outcomes related to preterm deliveries. And you go to the next slide and we look at what's happening across the country as it relates to race and, and ethnicity, ethnic disparities by state. And if you look at Pennsylvania and you look at the shades, we are not the darkest, but we're very close. And this tells us that we are really in trouble compared to other states in our, in our, our country, that this is an issue that our babies are not living, our black babies particularly are not living to see their first birthday. And I tell you that because I wanna talk about a program later on. So we go to the next slide. The March of Dimes does this, um, does a, um, uh, a scorecard basically, and it looks at, what's happening in many of the countries across, many of the states across the country. And if you look at that, where we are, as far as in this kind of light purple area, we have a, a we're at a C. And so we really wanna be at an A, which is less than 7.7%. .7%. And so we are not doing that well. And we, if we refer back to the gender race report that we did, that was done here in 2017, we know that we're in trouble. And this is a place we need to start in order to lay, uh, level the playing fields as relates to equity of care, especially around moms and babies. And when we go to the next slide, this slide is, is where we wanna start as far as our, our city and our, our counties. So we know that every country, we look at in the big picture, every country's health is measured by the health of their babies, the infant mortality rate of their babies. And so we have high, a higher rate of infant mortality rate here in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County than many other places. And that black women are two times more likely to die here in Pittsburgh versus white women. And these rates go all the way across what we are, our footprint is into Erie, into New York, West Virginia, and into Delaware. And if you look at the, the next slide, what I've done is uh, looked at that report that came to us just to show you how bad it is, but where the opportunities are. Because if we embrace those issues that we talked about and move forward, then if we embrace the data, then we know that we need to start here and really help black women have a better experience in delivering their babies here or right here in Pittsburgh. And if we go to the next slide, 
this is the slide that compares West Virginia, Delaware, and Pennsylvania, and it's all related to preterm births and infertility rate. And I want you just to focus on Pennsylvania. We are at a C, 9.9% .9 compared to West Virginia, which receives an F, and Delaware, which receives a D. And across the board, none of us are doing a great job of saving Black babies. If we can decrease the death of Black babies, we decrease the death of all babies, and we make a difference that, that you know, that we talked about the sum, you know, uh, the net sum. We, we really want to make sure that if we help one, we're going to help the other. No one is going to be deprived of making sure that they're getting great health care. And if you go on to the next slide, then this is what uh, a program that I belong to in uh, Cleveland. I was actually the head of one of their, their um, what they call action groups. But this is the methodology that we're using here at Highmark to build a network and to orchestrate our entire community to embrace those, those um, implementations across our system, across our footprint, in every um, medical entity that takes care of women, including, of course, Daggio. And we decreased the mortality rate for babies from 10.51 in 2015 to, to 7.58 in 2020. Remember, we had that got an A grade because we decreased the death of black babies uh, by 28%. And so when we decrease the death of black babies, if you see, look at the death of white babies and look at the death of Latino babies and everyone benefited. So this is a model that we will be using here, right here in our own backyard. So next slide um, really is um, to talk about how we're gonna do that. And then I'll talk a little bit about how moms should take care of themselves. And so we have this four prong approach that we've used um, in many of the other cities. And that is firstly, first looking at racial disparities, embracing the fact that we have racial disparities and that we do not use the data in order to take care of our black mothers better, in order to make sure we meet them where they are, giving them complete wraparound care. And this talks about analyzing and educating and giving support services like doulas, like community health workers, making sure that clinicians are partnering with them in a way that they understand where they're coming from, but also implementing centering care. Centering care has been successful across this country, and we need to look at if we don't have centering care in most of our, our facilities, in our healthcare um, clinician, in our healthcare facilities, we need to get them because this is a place we know the numbers make a difference. We're going to address extreme uh, prematurity. We talked about that a little bit, but that means that we have to not only allow moms to have access, but to really talk about making sure they feel like they belong to our systems and that we are giving great care. And that's all systems. We're not just talking about Highmark AHN. We're talking about being partners with every, every system in this city that touches a woman during this time. Educated about safe sleep. We all know about safe sleep. There's, there are more accidents, more sleep accidents there are that exist. Um, what we talked about SIDS in the past, right? So Babies are not dying from SIDS at the numbers they were dying before. In fact, they're significantly low, but more babies are dying from sleep accidents. And how do we prevent those? And really looking at those programs again and thinking about how we deliver baby boxes. What are we doing with our, our pack and plays? How are we giving mom support? But if, we, if a mom needs a pack and play or a place for her, mom, her baby to sleep, there are other issues we need to be concerned about. What about food insecurities? What about transportation? All of those things that we need to think about and how we deliver that care to that mom. And then of course, concentrating on this fourth trimester. What happens when mom leaves and goes home? Do we have enough behavioral health services for them? Do we have community health workers, doulas who are following them into the community? And how can we build those services in our, in our community so that they're getting the care that they need? And if you go to the next slide, this talks about uh, a little bit about what happens during the pregnancy process and how we can make a difference. To, to decrease that disparity gap, to make sure there is equity of care. And it's listed here, many things that we talk about pre-pregnancy. And the second one was pregnancy is a choice. That's a big deal, right? We think about what's happened politically and making sure that pregnancy remains a choice. Um, we're not talking about being an anti-abortionist or a pro-life. We're talking about women being able to take care of their own bodies and really being in that space where they're um, thinking about self-preservation, which is one of the other big ones on this page. And then making the decision to have a child, giving them opportunity to educate someone about preparing for this great opportunity, both physical, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and economical. So those are the things that I, that I am recommending and that I see all the time when I take care of women. 
how do we get ready to even have a baby? And then the next slide goes into how, once we are pregnant, what do we need in this pregnancy state? And the big thing with the first one is, we, it requires a village. That village really means our healthcare system as well, how we treat women, how we engage, how many touch points we have with women. Everyone who puts a stamp on the envelope, who transports someone through the hallway, who has a conversation with a woman, you are part of that village and you must take that responsibility very, very seriously. And again, surrounding them with allies. You, we are allies as clinicians, as social workers, as everyone in our, in our space to take care of them. We, they must know that we are allies, really make sure that they uh, have their wishes granted during their pregnancy experience, but they have the knowledge and the understanding and that we're advocating that so that we can hear their voices and that they hear our voices directing them in a way that this is gonna be a better outcome. And then the next slide, is really talking about that postpartum period, that period where they go home and many times they're alone. We must make sure that we have significant contact and touch points with them at that point um, because this is all about all of us being together to decrease that disparity gap. And the same issue around the village, what do they need to be self-affirmed? What do they need to make sure that they are taking care of themselves as well as taking care of their babies? And if you go to the next slide, which is um, the last slide, and this is all about how we work together to have, make sure that maternal health and uh, neonatal health really get the opportunity to be in a space of equity of care. And this signifies how we need to be this family, clinicians, friends, this whole network of folks who work together to make sure these outcomes are great outcomes and better outcomes than we see. So with that, I know that Adagio Health is in this, in this advocacy space. They're giving this great care that they are going to continue. And I'm going to say thank you so very much for allowing me to have a platform to tell you how I think we should near the gap of, uh, the, the gap of uh, disparities and make sure that we are giving much more equitable health. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Pettigrew for your commitment and for all that you are doing to strengthen health equity and to empower women, it is inspiring. We are so fortunate to have you doing your good work in our community. I hope that there are opportunities for Adagio Health to partner with you and to support your efforts. Once again, thanks to all of our sponsors and especially our presenting sponsor, the Highmark Foundation. And thanks to all of you for joining us for this edition of the Adagio Health Better Health Outcomes Speaker Series. In a year of turmoil and uncertainty, it has been our privilege to present this series and we look forward to returning in 2022. In the meantime, our medical offices, our mobile health unit, WIC, nutrition and tobacco cessation teams are ready to provide care for you and your families. Be well, be smart, get vaccinated against COVID-19 if you haven't already, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.